sleepapnea.org presents Portraits, Living with Sleep Apnea, a conversation with Dr. Christian Gilmino. How did your work begin? It's what we understand about uh, sleep disorder breathing. The initial idea was very simple. Um, if we can recognize uh, the problem behind the development of abnormal breathing during sleep, uh, we may be able to treat this element and eliminate the development of adult obstructive sleep apnea. Currently, for most people, obstructive sleep apnea is a fat person. And that's the wrong idea. There is no doubt that obesity is going to make uh, obstructive sleep apnea uh, very clear. And there is one, one reason which was uh, very well shown in uh, Philadelphia by the group of uh, Dr. Schwartz and uh, uh, Dr. Pack, which is that you put fat in your tongue and uh, your tongue being in your upper airway is going to, uh, to make the obstruction much uh, obvious. Actually, years and years ago, with a physician here, his name was Andrew Jamison, we had shown already that when you have a very large airway from the start, you can become very overweight without developing obstructive sleep apnea. If you have a small airway, you uh, put a little on weight and you are going to develop a pretty bad sleep apnea. But the findings show that yes, weight is an important variable, but it's a secondary variable. And the idea is still, can we prevent the development of obstructive sleep apnea? So we can prevent it yeah, by making people lose weight. Some studies say that even if you lose 15 pounds, you may have already an impact on the fat infiltrating your, your muscle of the tongue. But that's not the issue. A lot of people who are not overweight are going anyway to develop sleep apnea. So the solution is not there. Basically, where is located the airway? Uh, and the upper airway, it's uh, a collapsible tube surrounded by muscle and formed by muscle. And these muscles are hooked on bone the bone of your face. So there were a question, which is, how do you grow your face? It's like everything else. If you do not grow something well, it's going to have consequences. Uh, the consequences, you may see them immediately, or you may see them years later. So. That's how we have to look at the issue. And we have to recognize that uh, we did not know as well as we do today how uh, the face of the human grow and all the factors that are um, impinging on that growth. Um, and I'm not sure that we know everything about it today, and there is more to learn. We have made progress. We can try to see what are the problems that may weaken or impair or, or impact uh, the growth of um, the support of the upper airway. When does that happen? How it happen? What can we do about it? And if we correct that early, can we change the trajectory uh, of the evolution? And let's face it, uh, sleep disorder breathing, in many cases, 
start at birth and you are going to have negative feedback induced by a defect which is going to lead to another defect, etc. When we talk about obstructive sleep apnea, we are talking about the end of the road, okay? It's a bit like we know that it's not good to have high blood pressure, um, and we know that uh, people who have high blood pressure, if it's not treated, they are going to have progressively cardiac failure, they may have stroke, they may have a heart attack, etc. So it's very good to treat the stroke and a heart attack, but wouldn't it be better to recognize what lead to the high blood pressure and eliminate that? And that was the idea before be, behind or what we have tried to do. Um, and when we looked at the upper airway and what surround the upper airway, uh, it's a lot of uh, structure not owned by any specialist. Of course, dentists and orthodontists have to deal with the region all the time, but also neurologists have to deal with the region because um, it's a flex the upper airway is a flexible, collapsible tube made of muscle, Muscle is part of neurology, and they are controlled by nerve, and nerve respond to reflexes, so it's the old part of neurology. So, you see, from the very start, we don't have one ownership. We have many owners, and uh, that's the idea. Um, each of these owner as a specialized expertise, recognize things, know um, what to look for. And uh, that was the idea that when we see a patient, we should have a view of all the problem and at any age, can we do better? And so that's the question. Discuss the role of the sleep medicine specialist. I believe that the head of the orchestra is the sleep medicine specialist, knowledgeable in sleep medicine, but he need the help of all the other, or the orchestra, to uh, do a good diagnostic and a good treatment. And that's uh, behind the idea of a multidisciplinary clinic where, you know, every patient, and the younger the patient, the more difficult it is, every patient is a bit different. And the consequence of A on B and B on C and A on C is different depending on the age, depending on the pregnancy, the fetal history. So it starts very early in life, okay, very early in life. So if we want to really address the problem, which is um, how do we uh, control and repair the wall, where there is a bad brick, and uh, we have to recognize where it is and also have the specialized knowledge of what can be done. So it's a fairly simple idea. Looking ahead, discuss what we need to do. What I would say is uh, that we have to recognize risk factors and we have to progress in our knowledge. You have aggregate of obstructive sleep apnea in certain families, and you see it in adult, you see it in children, so uh, that actually uh, is a fact. There are family in which you have obstructive sleep apnea to the point that uh, this led uh, Dr. Susan Redline to do a um, genetic study to try to see was there one gene which was responsible for all these uh, obstructive sleep apnea appearing in, uh, in uh, families. And the answer is no. If there was only one gene, one gene, et cetera, uh, everything will be resolved, okay? 
So it's not. Uh, we are talking about a complex region, but that's why you need to have expertise from many sources uh, to, uh, to respond to the question. If there was, again, a uh, very simple uh, solution, we would have resolved the problem years ago. Discuss what is missing in sleep medicine. You know, sleep medicine is internal medicine during sleep. Our sleep disorder breathing is only one, one syndrome that we deal in sleep medicine. Um, and uh, you have to, to learn uh, this type of sleep medicine. And maybe um, what is missing the most uh, is a sufficient number of sleep medicine specialists with, that are trained uh, in all aspects of sleep medicine. Um, there are very few program, training program in the U.S. where we have both pediatric and adult and where we really form sleep medicine physicians a lot because the field is new. We started being barbers, and then we became surgeon a long time ago. And, uh, but there were already description uh, in the old book that there were things which happened only during sleep. Nothing is new. What we uh, do is refine it and refine the, the treatment approaches and recognition. Why is a sleep medicine specialist put in a role of the chief of the orchestra? It's because during sleep, you change the tone, the muscle tone. Uh, you have two different types of sleep. Um, you change the reflexes and the control. And you are going to have more vulnerable period during sleep which will allow you to see more problem. We don't have necessarily the solution. We may try to understand how that developed, what's the interaction between A and C, and that's the research, but that's, that's the issue. We have to understand uh, what's behind what's caused the problem, and not only one, the obvious, but we have to understand everything uh, which is involved and uh, deal with it. And that's where also you need to have a multidisciplinary clinic uh, because uh, also what do you select as the first approach? How do you plan the treatment, and that's one of the advantage of a multidisciplinary clinic is because you have, for one patient, multiple ex uh, expertise which are available and where the patient learn one medical act is only part of a journey. You don't end there then you are going to have to have the re-education. So we have all these people who have expertise. And we tell them, you have your expertise, but you are going to learn something completely different, which is sleep medicine. And you are going to be a team, and you have your own expertise, and you are going to also teach your colleague uh, from what you know, but at the end, we want that you have absorbed everything to be able to uh, handle patients with sleep disorders and independently where you started from. That spot should be part of teaching, and that is uh, what sleep medicine should offer.
Visit sleepapnea.org now to learn more.